Islam takes care of us, how it takes care of how we're feeling, our emotions, whether we're happy, whether we're sad, what we're thinking, how we're thinking, and how we can control our thoughts. And we're looking today in particular on how to take care of ourselves. We looked yesterday at taking care of other people and the day before. And it's very important to take care of other people, like we said. And who do we take care of, most importantly? our parents. We have to take care of our parents. After them, our family, our brothers, sisters, cousins, aunties, uncles. After them, our friends, the people who we turn to when we can't turn to our family. The people who know about us, who know the things that we can't exactly tell our parents sometimes. And after that, our community. But you'd think that when taking care of other people, when doing something good like that, there's no such thing as too much. You can't take care of other people too much. But in Islam, we're told that we can. In Islam, we're told that it is possible to be worrying about other people too much. When? What's too much? If I'm doing something good, then surely there's no too much. You can't do too much of a good thing. But you can. You can have too much of a good thing. It's like, for instance, me. I like Snickers. But if I have too many Snickers bars, then I don't want any more. I start to feel sick, it gets too sweet. 
In the same way, when I start to worry about, worry about other people too much, to the point where it starts to do damage to me, where it starts to become bad for me, when I start taking care of other people so much that I forget to take care of myself, that's taking care of others too much. That's when I have to stop. And I have to start focusing on me a little bit. That's when I have to start worrying about myself a little bit and how to take care of myself. And Islam does tell us that we have to take care of ourselves. It puts a great importance in taking care of ourselves. In fact, Allah Azawajal, in Surah Al-Maida, He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, alaykum and fusukum. Oh, you who believe, you have a duty upon yourselves. What's that duty? What duty do I have to myself? That's the duty of care. The duty of taking care of myself. We say that when we come into this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this body. But what we also say in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiul. And to Allah we return. What does that mean? That means this body, our physical self, we have to actually return that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This isn't ours to keep. This is something that we borrowed from Allah. So we have to give it back to him at some point. Now, if you were to give me something, for instance, I remember a long time ago, back when the best gaming console was a Nintendo Wii, I gave my friend my copy of Mario Kart, and when he gave it, he gave it back to me, it was scratched, and it wouldn't work in the Wii anymore. Now, do we want to be the kind of people that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us something, when we have to give it back to him, should we have damaged it? Should we have ruined it? No. We should give it back in the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to us. We should give it back in the best condition possible. Now, how do we do that? How do we give these bodies back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best condition possible? It requires a lot of care. It requires us to take care of ourselves a lot. And we said that we'd look at how Islam takes care of us. How Islam helps us. And we also said that Islam doesn't necessarily say to us that if you're going through this problem, this is the solution. If you're feeling sad, then do this. If you're feeling worried, then do this. Islam doesn't necessarily do that. Instead, it tells us how to live our life so that if we are sad, we can come out of that sadness. And ideally, if we live our life in that way, then we don't fall into that sadness, but sometimes we do. And today, we'll look at how that works. Today, the way we're gonna look at how to take care of ourselves is we'll look at what psychology tells us, what the new information tells us is important, how science tells us to take care of ourselves. And then we'll look at whether Islam agrees or not. Then we'll look at what Islam tells us. Are the things that Islam tells us the same as what science is now telling us? Remembering that Islam is a religion that comes from 1400 years ago. It says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenu. On this day I have completed for you your religion. So when that ayah came down, roughly 1400 years ago, from then on Islam hasn't changed. From then on nothing has changed. Things I'll tell you today, science's perspective, science's view, these are all things that science has discovered, that science has realized within the past 10, 15 years. But when we look at the Islamic perspective, I'll tell you what Islam said 1400 years ago. We can see that Islam does take care of us. If we look at what we're going to look through today, Islam does take care of us. Even if science is only just realizing it now, it's been there for us right from the very beginning. Recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala The very first thing, one point we'll make, exercise. To take care of our bodies, first and foremost, what must we do? We must exercise. We must actually physically take care of our body. What kind of exercise, what things we do, these are all important. For each different person, they require a different form of exercise. For somebody older, they might not need as much exercise as somebody younger. For somebody who gets tired quickly, they might need to do a little bit less exercise than somebody who can last a long time. For instance, if you go to the gym, if you've just started going gym, it might take you 15 minutes to get to the same point where somebody who's been going gym for a long time will reach. See, because somebody who's been going gym for a long time, it might take them 45 minutes to get tired. 
might take them 45 minutes to work out to the point where they've worked themselves out, where they've burned themselves out. But if you've just started, then it should only take you 15, maybe 20 minutes. It won't take you as long. Now the importance of exercise. What exercise actually does for us. One thing, and we're talking about our feelings, our emotions. <coughs> One very important thing that exercise can do for us is it can improve our mood. It can make us feel better, make us happier. How do we know this? First, we'll look at the scientific perspective. We'll look at what science tells us. In a study published in 2010 in a magazine known as the Journal of Sports and Exercise Psychology, a study was done. And people found that after doing exercise, their, their mood was better. This is what the study found, that when they would do exercise, they used to feel good about themselves. But what kind of exercise? Were they doing intense exercise? Were they doing really difficult exercise? No. Light exercise, a brisk walk, a, small, a light jog, things like this. In that same journal, in 2009, a study was published that said three to five days a week, if you do a light exercise, a brisk walk, go for a jog, for just 30 to 35 minutes, that has the best impact on your mood, on how you're feeling, making you feel better about yourself, making you enjoy your day. We all have days where our mood is off, where we don't feel good, things annoy us, they get on our nerves. We all have those kind of days. This says that just three to five times a week, if you exercise for just 30 to 35 minutes, and that exercise can be something very small. It can be, for instance, if rather than coming to a time by car, you walk it. It can be, for instance, just going for a jog in the local park. It can be anything like that, something small. These things can help. They can improve your mood. They can make you feel better. And another important thing to mention. When we mentioned about taking care of other people, when we spoke about the science to look out for, to see if somebody isn't feeling right, to see if somebody might be feeling upset or worried or going through something difficult, we said one of the signs that we look for is whether they are sharp, whether they're focused, or whether they seem distracted, whether they seem lost. One thing that we know from recent scientific studies, from recent scientific developments, is that when we exercise regularly, our brain starts to grow new brain cells. We become more focused, we become more sharp. That same study that we mentioned in 2010, published in the Journal of uh, Sports and Exercise Psychology, the people who took part in that study, participants, they reported that after doing exercise, after working out, they felt more refreshed, they felt more alert, they're more aware of what was going around us. I think the word the study uses specifically is they felt more awake. They felt more conscious of what's going on around them, what's happening around them. So this is what science tells us, the effects of exercises. There's many other effects of exercise. There's many other effects of working out. These are just a few of the ones that we mentioned here. This is what science tells us that exercise can do for us. This is what science tells us the reason is for why we should exercise. But we said we want to look at the Islamic perspective what Islam tells us. So what's Islam's view on exercise? What's Islam's view on keeping fit, on working out, going to the gym, going for a jog, going swimming? Now if we look at the Quran, we look at the Hadith, there's not a lot of things we find. There's not a lot of things in the Quran and the Hadith about exercise. Except if we look at what was actually done in those days how the Prophet lived his life, how the Imams lived their life, how they told the people to live their lives at the time. <coughs> we can find that there were some sports, some exercises, that in the time of the Prophet were very heavily emphasized. The Prophet used to tell people to do them. Amongst those one was swimming. The Prophet, in the Prophet's time rather, people were instructed and encouraged to go swimming. One of the exercises from the early days of Islam, which was very highly recommended. Now, if you actually look at swimming, which muscle does swimming work out? Does anybody know? When we go swimming, at one point, at one time, we exercise every muscle in our body. Because swimming isn't something that you do just with your legs. It's not something you do just with your arms. It's not just something you do just with your core. It's not something you just use your back for or your chest for. But at the same time, you use all of your muscles in swimming. 
one of the most important exercises that were mentioned from the time of the Prophet, that people are instructed to do at the time of the Prophet is swimming. Another one, I mean, according to the Olympics, it's a sport, but we might not consider it now, is horse riding. Riding horses seems like it's not a sport. You're sitting down, you're letting the horse do the work. Really, it's more of an exercise for the, for the horse than you. But in those days, we are told that the sport or the exercise of horse riding, of controlling a horse, is very important. It's taken care of. It's another exercise that was done in those days. Now, of course, for us, it might be a bit more difficult. For me in South London, it's very difficult to go horse riding, to own a horse. I've got friends in Australia, they own horses, they do things like that. We can't necessarily do that. But we're looking at the importance of exercise, the importance of keeping ourselves fit, physically. And we're also looking at how that affects ourselves and our fitness mentally, how that affects how we're feeling. So we have to look at the different things that we do. So we've mentioned swimming, we've mentioned horse riding. Another very important one, from the time of the Prophet, a sport that at that time was heavily emphasized upon by everyone is archery, firing a bow and arrow, firing it on target. This is one of the things that before Prophet Muhammad taught the, taught the people about Islam, in the period known as Jahiliyyah, this is something that the Arabs were very good at. And there were certain traditions of the Arabs before Islam that the Prophet got rid of. For instance, one of them is that the Arabs were not proud of having daughters. In fact, when a baby girl was born, the Arabs would bury the baby girl. The Prophet got rid of this tradition. Why? Because it was not one that was in accordance with Islam. It was not in line with what Islam teaches. So the Prophet got rid of it. But see, archery was one of the traditions, one of the sports that the Arabs were very proud of that the Prophet did not get rid of. In fact, he encouraged it. He took part in it. The Prophet himself would encourage the people to take part in archery. And archery, again, when you look at the muscles it uses, you use your upper body for archery. From your core, to your back, to your chest, to your arms. All of these muscles were intact. You're using them when you're doing archery. And if, you ever, if you've ever done archery with a metal bow and arrow, the type they might have had in those days, you'll know how heavy the bow and arrow is. You'll know how difficult it is to actually keep it up, keep it on target. And at the same time, as you do that, you have to be focused. When you're doing archery, when you're firing a bow and arrow, what are you trying to do? You're trying to hit a target. So at the same time, your body is focusing on holding the bow and arrow, and your eyes and your mind are focusing on your target. You're exercising your physical body as well as your mind at the same time. You're exercising the two things together. And another thing the Prophet was known for, it's something that's not very well known by the Prophet, is the Prophet loved walking and walking fast. According to some of the companions of the Prophet, the Prophet used to walk so fast that they used to have to jog to keep up with him. At times they would have to break into a, into a light jog, just to keep up with the Prophet, because he used to walk so fast. And if we look at the time of the Prophet, we see that the Prophet had horses. We mentioned yesterday Messiah. The Prophet had Zuljana. He used to ride Zuljana. He had other horses. But if we look at all the stories of the Prophet, for his life in Medina. For instance, the story where a woman threw rubbish at him. I won't go over the story, the majority of you will know it. But we see the Prophet was walking from his house to Masjid al-Nabawi. If you look at the other stories of the Prophet, for instance, when he goes past the graveyard, at one point he walks past the graveyard quickly and on the way back, he stops at the graveyard. Again, the Prophet is walking. At a time where everybody used to ride on horses, everybody would go everywhere by horse. The Prophet constantly walked, always walked, everywhere he went, showing the importance of this walk. And what did our scientific study say? What did the journal publish? That a brisk walk, 30 to 35 minutes, three to five times a day, is the best form of exercise for improving your mood, improving how you feel. That's what the study found. And 1400 years ago, the Prophet, when he could have used other means of transport, when everybody around him used to use other means of transport, he preferred to do what? To walk, and according to his companions, to walk fast, a brisk walk, to walk quickly. Now, we look at these Islamic instructions. We look at these different things, the scientific side, the Islamic side. Now, science tells us one thing. Islam seems to agree with it. But like we said, 
it's not as easy for us to go horse riding. It's not as easy for us to do archery. Sure, swimming we can do. But what other ways are there that we can keep ourselves fit? How do we keep ourselves active? For those of you who've been here from day one, you know I'm gonna say football. Of course, football is one of the best things, for me, at least. Other sports, other things, team sports especially. Things that keep you engaged, keep you around other people. Things that bring you closer to other people. So for instance, in football. Now, I currently study in Iran. I moved there about eight months ago. When I first arrived, I didn't know the language. I didn't really know anybody there. In fact, when I first arrived, I didn't know where I'd be staying when I arrived. I got in a cab and I didn't know where the cab was taking me. Somebody else had arranged the cab for me. What I did know was football. I knew before I arrived in Iran that every Thursday, there's students there who play football. And I went and I played. And the majority of friends I have now are friends who I gained in that sport when I was playing football. And we still do play every week. And every time someone new comes, that's the first thing we invite them to. Why? It's a team sport. It's something we do together. It brings us together, brings that feeling of community. And when we look at our psychological well-being, when we look at our health, psychologically, how we're feeling, this feeling of togetherness, this feeling of community can be very important. This feeling that I'm not on my own, it can be very important. And when we engage in team sports, when we engage with those around us in a way that they need me and I need them, it can build that bond. It can build that realization that I'm not alone. Really and truly here, I'm with other people, people who care about me, people who I care about. When we play team sports, things like that, it can bring us about social. It can help us to be more socially active, make new friends, <coughs> meet new people. And it can also bring about confidence within ourselves. Inshallah, in a few days, we'll speak about self-esteem about being confident within ourselves. When you find something that you like, find something you enjoy, something like football, for instance, something you're good at, it can help you feel good about yourself. It can help you see your own worth, see something that you're good at, your own talent, something that other people look at you for and think, I wish I was like that. I wish I could be as good as him. And you have that. I know you guys play football. I know you guys have teams that go every year, go to different tournaments. I've played against you guys. I've beat you guys. <laughs> now we have to remember that these kind of sports, of course, Islam always tells us in moderation. But if we give focus to these kind of things, it helps us. Another thing, for instance, working out. Again in Iran, me and my friends, we work out. But we work out together. Why? One, it gives us motivation. When you're going to gym and doing things like that, it's very easy to slack off. It's very easy to become lazy, to not want to work out, especially for me. So in Iran, I made a deal with the guys who used to work at the gym, with the instructors. The way our building is set up is upstairs is our accommodation, downstairs is the gym. They also have the canteen downstairs. We all eat together in the accommodation. I made a deal with the guys in the gym. I said to them, apart from rest days, obviously, but every single day that I don't come gym, to each of the 200 students that live here, I'm gonna serve dinner. And from that moment on, I never missed a single day. From that moment on, I didn't miss gym at all. Find yourself something that motivates you, that keeps you going. When I was in London, I used to go with my friend. When I was going alone, I'd think, you know what, today I'll leave it. Today I don't have the effort. But then when my friend would ring me and say, I'm here, where are you? And I'd still be in bed. I think, okay, now I've got to go, now I've got to get up, now I've got to leave. And once you get there, once you're there, you have that motivation, you have somebody to work out with, it keeps you going, it keeps you working. And especially with something like gym, or with something like football, if you do it weekly, it can build routine. That's the next point we'll look at. Our routine, our schedule. How important is routine for our emotions? How is it for how we're feeling? What impact is having a good routine have on how I'm feeling. Surely, whether I'm doing something on time, or whether I'm doing something by routine, or whether I'm not doing it by routine, doesn't really have anything to do with the way I'm feeling. How does that affect whether I'm happy or whether I'm sad, whether I'm worried, whether I'm stressed? How does that have any effect? And you see, routine has a few different effects on us. Having a schedule, there's a few different things it does for us. 
amongst those, one of the important things is it gives us a little bit of purpose. If I know that I have to wake up at this time and then do this, once I finish that, I have to do something else. After that, I've got something else to complete, another task to complete. I have to do this, then this, then this. First, it gives us a sense of purpose for that day. I know what I need to do today. Second, at the end of the day, it gives us a sense of achievement, if we follow it. At the second point, it helps us look back on our day, understand what we did for today. Was today worthwhile? Did I do something useful with my day? Now, when we look at how we're feeling, our emotions, one reason that a lot of people feel sad, and it's mentioned by some philosophers, psychological philosophers, they say that happiness has four requirements, like the formula for happiness, if you will. They say for happiness, the four things you need, and I'm not talking just about feeling happy, I'm talking about mentally being happy, genuinely satisfied, being in a state where you're relaxed, you're content, you're happy with life. The first thing is to have things that are worth being happy about, to have pleasures in your life. The second thing is to not have displeasures in your life. So not have things that worry you and stress you and to not have things that bring you down in life. The third thing that is required for happiness is, enough, is your own sense of content. That you can look at your life and think, overall, my life is good. We all go through things in life that are good. We all go through things in life that aren't so good. A lot of them come at the same time. But it's overall way of looking at our life. If I can look at my life as a whole and think, my life is good. My life is going well. Things are good, good for me. Then that can add to the happiness, and I need that as well, this overall look. That's the third thing I would like. And the fourth thing that is said we require, that is said we require is purpose. We need a reason for our life. One feeling that a lot of people seem to feel, especially as they grow older, they start to wonder what they're doing with their life. What's the point? Some of the older guys might find themselves asking that question a lot. What's the point? What am I doing here? What am I doing with myself today? What am I doing with myself overall? Is life just get up, go to school, go to work, come home, eat, sleep? Or is there some greater purpose? Is there some greater meaning? When we have this greater purpose, this greater meaning, and we'll look more at the purpose that we're given in the coming days, but when we have this greater purpose and this greater meaning, we can start seeing ourselves as on a track. We can start seeing a path for ourselves. And when we set ourselves these little goals, like we do in a routine, in a schedule, the goal of waking up at this time, the goal of completing this task by this time. For instance, those of you who are studying, those of you, those of you who've got exams coming up, when you set yourself those kind of targets, those kind of schedules, so for instance, I'm gonna study for, for instance, one hour, then take a short break. Then I'm gonna study for another hour, study my next subject, and take a short break. When we do these things, it gives us a purpose. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know why I'm doing it. It gives us that sense of purpose. Now with routine and with schedule, you all know what I'm going to say, the Islamic instructions. You all know how Islam gives us routine and gives us schedule. Routine, five times a <coughs> We get up, we pray our salah, we continue with our day. If we shape our day around these five prayers, we schedule our day around these five prayers, we give ourselves that sense of routine. We give ourselves little checkpoints within the day. For instance, right now. At the moment, I'm staying here in Salah. So all I'm doing is studying for these lectures. That's all I do. But I still give myself little targets. I think by Zohar time, I will have woken up, I will have gotten ready, I will have decided exactly what structure I'm going to speak in. Then I come here, I read Zohar, I have lunch, I go back. And then I decide that I've got till Maghrib time. And now till Maghrib time, what am I doing? I'm deciding on the context. And then one hour before Maghrib, I start preparing for Messiah. I start preparing for reciting the tragedy of the Prophet. Now, even though my whole day, it seems like I'm just doing one thing, my whole day, all I've done is prepare for my majlis. I've split it up. And I've used my namaz times as points of reference. 
I'll do this by Zohar time. I'll do this by Asr time. I'll do this one hour before Maghrib. I'll do this one hour after Maghrib. Now, when we look at our Salahs, when we look at our Namas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the reading of Islam, <coughs> through the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, He's been very specific with our timetables for the day, especially with regards to our namaz. How so? So, for instance, we're told that after Isha time, we should sleep. After Fajr time, however, we should not. We wake up for Fajr and we sleep after sunrise or closer to Zohar time. We're also told not to sleep before Isha. We're told not to sleep before Maghrib. Now, if we look at the importance of sleep, and there's different points in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions sleep. He mentions, them in different, mentions it in different ways. Often he tells us what sleep is. He tells us that sleep is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes our soul away. And for those who are going to live, those who are going to see the next day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns their souls to them in the morning when they wake up. For those who will not, for those whose time has come, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps their soul. And we're told that this is a kind of refresh for us, when our soul goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then comes back. Now one of the biggest causes today, in this day and age, one of the biggest causes for poor mental health, for feeling upset, feeling sad, for going through emotional and psychological difficulties is a lack of sleep. And you might notice it if you're one of the kinds of people, especially amongst the older guys here, if you're one of the people who stays up very late, not doing anything in particular, if you're one of those guys, and you might notice that when it comes to nighttime, that's the time where the more destructive thoughts start coming. That's the time where we start to think about our worries and our stresses. They start to pile up. The nighttime where everybody else is silent, everybody else is asleep, and we're just there with our thoughts, thinking. Islam gives a great importance to sleeping on time, on routine. It says sleep after Isha. And if you don't sleep after Isha, we're also told not to engage in idle talk. So if, you, if you're not asleep after Isha, do something useful. Do something worthwhile. For instance, this. After we read Maghrib and Isha, we've come here. We've sat down for a majlis. Islam has a lot of instruction regarding sleep. And we all know the importance of sleep, of sleep cycles. For instance, those of you who are in school, your teachers will tell you all the time how important it is to get enough sleep for your exams, for your studies, so that you can wake up the next day. And it's a marked difference. The days we sleep on time, wake up on time, <coughs> our attitude, our behavior, our ability to stay focused the next day is very different from the days where we don't sleep on time, where we're up till late whatever we might be doing. So for instance, when I was in Iran, I used to FaceTime my friend. But because there's a time difference, Iran is three and a half hours ahead of us. He'd normally get home from work at about midnight. That's when we'd speak, that's when we'd talk. For me, that was 3.30 in the morning. That's when my teachers started to become worried. They said to me, Zach, when you're in lesson, you can see you're trying to focus, but you're struggling. You're having difficulty. What is it? What's the matter? Except there's nothing wrong. I'm fine. I was happy in Iran. I'm enjoying myself there. So why was I distracted? Why was I focused? They asked me what I do with my time. I told them. And then I got to the point at night. And when I told them I sleep at about 5 a.m., I started speaking to my friend at about 3.30 to about 5. I sleep half an hour till Fajr and then stay awake till sunrise. They started to become worried. They started to tell me all about the different problems that come with sleeping late. All the different things that happen when you start to sleep late. And sleeping late has a big effect on our health. Has a big effect on our body as well. As does our diet. The way we eat, what we eat. Our diet is something that has a massive effect. And it's something we don't realize. Again, when I came across this, when I was doing my research, when I was studying, I looked and I thought, what does diet have to do with the way I'm feeling? If anything, when I go to the chicken shop, 
get five wings and chips, I feel happier than ever. I feel more happy when I'm eating that kind of stuff than when I'm taking too much care of my diet, when I'm focusing on what I eat, what I drink. But there was a study done, and I can't remember the name of the journal or the magazine that published it at the moment, but there was a study <laughs> done which found that for those people who do not watch what they eat, so for those people who have suffered from obesity as a result of their diet, or who are overweight as a result of their diet, they have a 55% greater chance of developing depression, of suffering from depression. And those people who suffer from depression have a 58% greater chance of putting on weight. This shows us a clear direct link between the two. Our diet, what we eat, what we drink is very important. And it's another thing that, again, Islam gives great emphasis on. In fact, Islam tells us exactly what we should eat. It tells us how much we should eat. It tells us when we should eat. If we look at the foods that are described, the foods that we're told to eat, we're told fish is one of the very important parts of our diet. To eat fish is very important. We're also told to eat vegetables is very important. We're told to eat that the oil that comes from fish, things like the oil that comes from fish, things like olive oil, things like this are very important. There was a recent study done, and again, the name of the publisher of that study escapes me. They said the best diet in the whole world, the best cuisine in the whole world for your health is Mediterranean cuisine. What's Mediterranean cuisine? It's fish, it's nuts, it's fruits, it's vegetables, and it's oils such as olive oil cod liver oil, things like that. The very same things that we've been told 1400 years ago in Islam and the Quran, those very same things are the things which science is now discovering. Which science is telling us now is important. It's helpful for us. I'll cut it short because we're running out of time. But if we look at all these different things, what Islam tells us to do, develop a routine, exercise, stay fit, stay healthy, watch what we eat. If we look at all these things, it's very easy to think that, well, these are obvious. These are things that I know. But it's important to remember that when we think of Islam as a holistic religion, Islam is a religion for everything. So Islam takes care of us. It's important to see how Islam's taking care of us. It's important to see that Islam's already told me to do all these things which I'm now realizing are important which we're now realizing or finding out are important. Islam does take care of us. It does have a huge impact on how we're feeling, what we're thinking, how we're doing psychologically. Today, as we remember the Shahad of Karbala, I'd like to remember one in particular. Prasad Khorban. He was a great man. But what was the greatest lesson we learned from Prophet? The ayah I recited at the start, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, rahmat Allah. Do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Do not despair in the mercy of Allah. We use it to talk about how we're feeling, psychologically, emotionally. It's also used to say that it's never too late to turn back to Allah. It's never too late to realize I made a mistake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all forgiven. Every mistake that we can make, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive. This is the best lesson we learned from Hazrat Paul. It was as Imam Hussein alayhi salam was traveling from Medina towards Karbala. They reach a point in the desert. The sun is boiling. The sands are hot. Imam Hussain alayhi salam says to Hazrat Abbas, Abbas, look over in the distance. Do you see something coming towards us? Hazrat Abbas looks at Imam Hussain, he says, it looks as though there are trees coming towards us. Imam Hussain says, no Abbas, these are not trees that are coming towards us, these are flags. That is the army of Yazid coming for us now. The army arrives, led by one, Hur ibn Yazid al riyadh as a poor, he goes to Imam Hussain they speak. Then Imam Hussain 
He sees the soldiers of Borat first. He sees the horses cannot put their feet on the ground. The horses have metal hooves on their feet. When metal gets hot, it starts to burn. He sees the horses cannot keep their feet on the ground because of how hot it is. Imam Hussein sends Hajar Abbas to give water to the soldiers of Borat. There's one soldier who, after the Battle of Karbala, he tells his story. He says what happened to him. He says, I was so thirsty when I reached the caravan of Imam Hussein He says, when I reached the caravan of Hussein, I was so thirsty, I got off my horse to go and approach him. But as soon as I put my feet on the ground, I fell onto the ground. I lost all my energy because I was so thirsty in the desert. He says, at that point, a man came towards me and gave me a mush. A mushk is a water bottle, a water flask, or a water bottle. He says he hands me a mush. He says, I was so thirsty, I wanted that water so bad, that I snatched at it. And as I snatched at it, the water dropped. He says the mush dropped on the floor and all the water fell out onto the sands of Kerbala. He says, at this point, I saw a man who was sitting on a chair. The man gets up, pulls over to me, and with his own two hands, he starts to give me water. He says, with his own two hands, he gave me water. Afterwards, I asked, who was this man? Who was he sitting on the chair, surrounded by all the boys who came and gave me water? So I was told this was none other than Hussein ibn Ali. This is the very man we've come to capture. The very man we've come to take captive. Imam Hussein alayhi salam is mounted upon Zuljanah. He begins to move away. Tells Hazrat Abbas to get the caravan ready so they may move. At this point, Hur approaches Imam Hussein. He looks him in the eye, and at this point, according to some narrations, according to some narrations, Hazrat Hur grabs the rein of Zuljanah and pulls them towards him. He grabs Zuljanah and pulls him towards him so Imam Hussein cannot move away. At this point, Imam Hussein looks Hur in the eyes and he says, Hur, may your mother weep upon you. I ask Imam Hussein, oh Imam, if you knew that Hur would be on your side, why would you say such a thing to him? Why would you say this to him if you knew that he would come back to you? If his name was written in the list of shahada, why would you say this? Look at the response of Hazrat Hur. He says to Imam Hussein, if any other man in all of Arabia would have said that to me, I would have replied the same to them. But what can I do? Your mother is Sayyid al-Sahra. Your mother is Fatima bin Rasulullah. What can I do? I cannot say that to you. Imam Hussein, when he says to Hurma, your mother weep over you, he puts that thought in Hur's mind. From the second of Muharram onwards, Hur is thinking, what have I done? I have kept Hussein in Karbala. From the second of Muharram onwards, Hur is thinking, I have put the family of Rasulullah in danger. Seventh Muharram arrives. From now, Hur can hear the cries of the children in the camps of Imam Hussein. He can hear the children crying out at Atash. They cry from thirst. Hur thinks, this is because of me. Hur remembers, he is the one who had Hazrat Abbas move the tents away. He is the one who told <coughs> Imam Hussein to move his family away from the river Farad. This thirst is because of him. Their captivity is because of him. Everything that will happen now is because of him. Hur is starting to become worried. Inside, he is trembling. On the ninth Muharram, at night, he goes to Umar ibn Sa'd. He goes to Umar ibn Sa'd and he says, Umar ibn Sa'd, he says, Oh son of Sa'd, tell me, are we really going to go to war? Will there really be a battle? Umar ibn Sa'd looks at him and he says, Hur, we are going towards a battle that will be so great. You will watch one by one as the heads of the family of Hussein drop. This is what Umar ibn Sa'd says. Hur does not reply. He turns around. He goes into his tent. He gathers his things. He starts to leave his tent, mount his horse, and starts to slowly move towards the tents of Imam Hussein al Starts to move towards where Imam Hussein's family are. At this point, his son comes rushing out. According to some narrations, his servant comes out as well. They ask him, Hur, they ask him, oh father, where are you going? They think that Hur is about to go and attack the army of Imam Hussein. They think he is about to go and attack the Ahlul Bayt. Hur turns around and he says to his son, you ask me where I'm going? I'm leaving Jahannam and going towards Jannah. Jannah is with Hussein alayhi salam. Jahannam is with Yazid. Jahannam is with the, son, with the army of Umar ibn Sa'd. I'm going towards Jannah. His son then looks at him and says, Father, will you go to Jannah alone? Or will you take your son with you? He says to his son, if you wish to come, come, gather your things, we will go together. As a Hur starts to ride out towards the caravan of Imam Hussein, towards the tents of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. 
halfway between the tents of the armies of Yazid and the tents of Imam Hussein, Hazapur stops. He turns to his son and hands him two pieces of cloth. He says to his son, Oh my son, I am remembering two crimes of mine. I want you to do something for me. His son says what? He says, first, I looked Hussein Ibn Ali in the eyes. Take this cloth and blindfold me so that I do not, do not commit this mistake again. He says the second thing, when I saw Hussein, I grabbed Zuljana by the neck. Take this cloth and tie my hands. I do not want my master to see my hands open after I did this. They start to come right towards the camps of Imam Hussein. Hazapur, he has a blindfold on. They are going, going slowly. His hands are tied. He cannot go fast. Imam Hussein is, his, is in his tent. He says to Hazrat Abbas, Abbas, we have two visitors coming. We have two guests coming. Go and greet them. Welcome them to our camps. Hazrat Abbas, he starts to ride out towards Hazrat Pur and his son. Hazrat Pur can hear somebody coming towards him. He has a blindfold over his eyes so he cannot see. But he can hear somebody coming towards him. He asks his son, who is coming towards us? His son says, this is none other than Abbas ibn Ali. Hazrat Hur becomes worried. He says to his son, tell Abbas, tell Abbas we have not come to fight. We have not come for war. Tell him we have come to ask for forgiveness. Hazrat Abbas hears this. Before Hazrat Hur's son says anything, Hazrat Abbas says, oh Hur, I have not been sent to fight you. I'm not here to defend the camps of Hussein right now. No, Hur, Hussein has sent me to greet you and welcome you with open arms. Hazrat Hur says to Hazrat Abbas, oh Abbas, I wish to see my Mawla Hussein. I wish to meet my Mawla Hussein. I wish to speak to him. Imam Hussein is waiting in his tent. Hur is brought towards him. As he reaches the tent of Imam Hussein, Hur throws himself from his horse. He lands at the feet of Imam Hussein. He asks him for forgiveness. He says to him, I ask you for forgiveness. Please, on the day of judgment, do not say anything against me. Imam Hussein says, Hur, go, I forgive you. Hur, you have no crime against me. Hazrat Hur then turns and says something else. Will you listen to what Hur says at this point? Hazrat Hur says, Mawla, I have to ask you for one more thing. I wish to ask one, I wish one request of you. Mawla Hussein says, Hur, say it. What do you ask of me? He says, Mawla, when I first arrived, when I first intercepted your caravan, I spoke to you harshly. I raised my voice at that point. You said something to me. What did Imam Hussein say? Hur says, oh Mawla, at that point you said to me, Hur, Hur, lower your voice. You may have come alone, but with me are the daughters of Zahra. With me are the family of Rasulullah. Ya Imam, Hazrat Hur says to Imam Hussein, Ya Imam, I wish to go and ask forgiveness from the daughters of Zahra. I wish to go and ask forgiveness from the family of Rasulullah. Imam Hussein says, Go, Hur. Hur, you have my permission. Go and ask forgiveness from the daughters of Zahra. Hazrat Abbas takes him to the tent of Sayyid Zainab. Hazrat Hur, he stands outside the tent of Sayyid Zainab and he calls out to the women inside. He says to them, I am the criminal. I am the one who has put you in this position. I ask of you to forgive me. On the day of judgment, do not say to Sayyid Zahra that this is Hur who hurt us. On the day of judgment, do not complain to your mother Zahra. The women and children begin crying. At this point, Hur who is standing outside the tent falls again. He falls to the ground, he begins crying. He's wearing a helmet. He takes his helmet off and throws it to the side. He begins taking the sand of Karbala and pouring it through his head, crying. He cries to himself, oh Hur, look what you have done. For the second time now, you have made the daughters of Zahra cry. For the second time. You have made Zainab in the entirely cry. Hazrat Hur he's crying outside the tents. At one point, the voice of Sayyid Zainab is heard amongst all the crying. She calls out to Hazrat Hur, she says, Hur, rest assured, on the day of judgment, not only will I not complain to Sayyid Zahra, but Hur, I will take you myself to Sayyid Zahra. I will say to Zahra myself, This is Hur who gave his life for your Hussein. This is Hur who gave your life, who gave his life to save us. Hazrat Hur. He takes this from Sayyid Zainab. He's been forgiven by Imam Hussein. He's been forgiven by the women and the children. Now he comes to Imam Hussein, the day of Ashura. He says to Imam Hussein, Mawla, let me go. Let me be, in, be among the first, amongst the first to give my life. Imam Hussein gives him permission. He lets him go to battle. Hazrat Hur says to him, but Imam, first let me send my son. I do not wish for my son to see the armies of Yazid and become afraid. I do not wish for him to turn back to his destiny. Let me send my son before me. Imam Hussein says, Imam Hussein says, go, send your son first. I'll recite one last line of Messiah. Imam Hussein says to him, send your son. 
how the poor son rides out into the battlefield. His father is a great warrior and he is as well. He sends many of Yazid's army to hell. He kills many soldiers, but at one point he is struck. He falls from his horse and he calls out to his father. He calls out, oh father, come and help me. Oh father, I have fallen from my horse. Hazapur mounts his horse. He rides out as fast as he can into the battlefield. This is his young son. But as he reaches the body of his son, what does he see? As he reaches the body of his son, he sees Mawla Hussain on the floor. Poor son in his hands. He looks at Imam Hussain, he says, Mawla, this is the son of your servant. You should not have come. There was no need for you to come. Mawla Hussain looks at him and what does he say? He says, Hur, you are an old father. This is your young son. It is not the place of an old father to carry the body of his son. Mawla Hussain says, Hur, go back to the tent. I will bring the body of your son. No father can carry the body of his own son, but I, Ali Akbar. There is Mawla Hussein. There is Ali Akbar on the floor. Hussein runs towards the body. At one point he falls, at one point he stands. At one point he runs to the left, at one point he runs to the right, all the while crying out, Aina, Aina, Ali Akbar. Where are you, Ali Akbar? Call out to me, my son. The light has gone from my eyes. Allah, 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 Again, we'll ask the brothers to remain seated and wait while the sisters make their way upstairs. And then, inshallah, we will all go up together for a few moments to take part in the Allah, 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 Allah,